Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pediatrics, and to be more specific, I'll be covering Hertzsprung's disease. Before we get started, I'm going to ask you to please support my channel, like this video, you know you're going to love it, subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. In the comment section, let me know what you thought about this video, let me know what you'd like to see me cover next, and don't forget I have audio lessons available for you on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. All right guys, let's get started. So, Hertzsprung's disease. Look at what it says. It says Hertzsprung disease is a congenital, so they're born with it, congenital anomaly that results in mechanical obstruction from inadequate motility of part of the intestine. What is all these big words? What are they saying to us? They're telling us that there is obstruction. Fecal matter, because that's what we have in the GI tract, right, is not moving because lack of motility, lack of peristalsis. So let's look at the pathophysiology. Make this a little bit bigger for you. The pathology of Hertzsprung's disease is related to, and this is the key. This is the key, guys, that separates Hertzsprung's from other disorders. Look at this. The absence of ganglion cells in the affected areas of intestine. Okay? So why are these ganglion cells important? Let's keep going. It results in the loss of rectal sphincteric reflex, blah, blah, blah. So guys, remember that um, um, that area when you have a feces in the stools and it needs to come out of the anus, right? Your sphincter is supposed to relax so that the stool can go out freely. Let's look at what, what's happening here. The absence of the ganglion cells, because remember, that's what her sprung's all about. This patient's missing those ganglion cells. The absence of them in the affected bowel results in a lack of enteric nervous system stimulation. Why is that important? It decreases the ability of the internal sphincter to relax. If that internal sphincter does not relax, that fecal matter is not getting through. So what happens? It gets clogged up. Okay. Unopposed sympathetic stimulation of the intestine result in increased intestinal tone. In addition to the contraction of the abnormal bowel and the resulting lack of peristalsis, let's stop right there because that's important to understand. Remember, this patient um, lacks peristalsis because they don't have any of those ganglion cells. The resulting lack of peristalsis, there is a loss of rectal sphincteric reflex. Did you guys notice in two paragraphs, how many times have they told us that there's no ganglion cells or there's a lack of ganglion cells? How many times have they told us that that um, rectal sphincter has um, failed to relax? How many times have they told us in her sprungs that there's a lack of peristalsis? So all that fecal matter is just building up, building up. It's not getting out. They're telling us the same thing in many different ways. And I keep telling you guys, when you're studying, don't just read just to read. Stop. Say to yourself, what is this author saying to me? And why am I seeing this information so many times? Because it's important for you to know. Normally, when a stool bolus enters the rectum, what's supposed to happen, the internal sphincter is supposed to relax. Normally, that's what's supposed to happen. And the stool's evacuated. But in Hirschsprung's disease, the internal sphincter does not relax. That's like the third time. The author has said this to us. That is the whole point. What is going on in Hirschsprung's disease? That sphincter's not relaxing. The poop's not getting out. Let's look at the diagnostic evaluation. How do we know this patient has Hirschsprung's and not something else? Let's take a look at this box. The clinical manifestations of Hirschsprung's disease. In the newborn period, failure to pass meconium. Don't we, we expect that meconium to be passed within that 24 hours, latest 48 hours, but they fail to pass meconium within 24 to 48 hours after birth. Refusal to feed. Well, guess what? I would refuse to eat if I had a, a, a stomach full of fecal matter that I couldn't get out, right? So of course, they're not going to want to feed. They're going to feel full already because they have all this fecal matter that's just piling up. They're not able to evacuate their bowels. They're going to have a bilis of vomiting, abdominal distension because of all that fecal matter, infancy, failure to thrive, abdominal distension. 
childhood. Um, the symptoms appear more chronic, not as acute. Constipation. I put a star next to this and I wrote HESI, but honestly, this is on all three, HESI, ATI, and NCLEX. This is a classic symptom. When you see this, you need to recognize it as her sprungs, the ribbon-like foul-smelling stool. Ribbon-like, let me show this to you. I want you guys to have a visual picture. So look where the stool is supposed to come out, okay? But this patient's missing those ganglionic cells, right? This is the A ganglionic portion. And it says A because A means without, without ganglionic cells. So look how small and skinny that is. How's poop supposed to get through here? So the little bit of fecal matter that does get through this tiny little area comes out looking ribbon-like. It makes sense. All right. So when you see ribbon-like stools, you need to think of her sprungs. And I want you to think of this, um, visualization. And here's all the fecal matter that's accumulating here because it can't be evacuated through here. So yes, the stool is going to be ribbon-like and it's going to be foul smelling because how long has that stool been sitting here before that patient was finally able to get it out? Ribbon-like foul smelling stools, abdominal distension, um, visible peristalsis, easily palpable fecal mass. Look at this. Easily palpable, absolutely. So these are uh, the clinical manifestations, the ones that I, actually this needs a star too. The ones that I put a star next to, those are the ones that show up the most on test questions. And the ones I underlined are the ones you see very often. But guys, I don't write your tests, so make sure you know all of them because I don't know what your nursing instructor is going to give you, but make sure you know that these are the clinical manifestations of Hirschsprung's disease. Press pause if you need to, because I'm moving on. Let's take a look. Diagnostic valuation on examination. The rectum is empty of feces. Take a look again, guys. Look at what it looks like. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. The rectum is empty of feces. Hold on. It's um, empty of feces. The internal sphincter is tight. Remember, it's not relaxing. In its natural everyday state, it's going to be tight. It only relaxes for evacuation. So it remains tight because it's not relaxing. And the leakage of stool and accumulated gas may occur if the aganglionic segment is short. To confirm the diagnosis, Here's your key for confirmation, biopsy. Rectal biopsy is performed either surgically to obtain a full thickness biopsy specimen or by suction biopsy. But the point is to confirm what we suspect, the patient's going to get biopsy. And then what happens is when they take out a piece of um, that area, what they're going to look for is evidence of the um, aganglionic cells the lack of gangliotic cells. So that biopsy, when we see that lack of or absence of gangliotic cells, we know that the patient has Hirschsprungs and not something else. Therapeutic management. The majority of children with Hirschsprungs disease require surgery rather than medical therapy with frequent enemas. Surgical management consists of primarily removing that agangliotic portion, the portion that does not have those gangliotic cells, removing it removing it um, to relieve the obstruction, to restore normal motility, and to preserve the function of the external anal sphincter. So that's our number one go-to. Preoperative care. What are we going to do for this patient before surgery? Treatment with enemas. Low fiber. High calorie, high protein diet. Let's talk about this. I'm going to explain it because I don't want you guys to memorize. Memorizing never works. Well, I can't say never because a lot you have to memorize a lot for pharmacology. But other than pharmacology, when it comes to nursing, memorizing hardly ever works. There's too much to remember. But if you can understand, you'll never forget. So let's talk about this and why it is so you don't forget. Give me a second. All right. So we know about the enemas, low fiber, 
this is before the patient has the surgery. So this is before the problem's corrected, right? Low fiber, remember fiber helps you what? Bulk up your stool, helps you to be able to uh, uh, make the stool more palatable to pass through for evacuation, right? Well, this patient has a problem. Again, look at this. So when this patient has this agangliotic portion, look at this rectum, look at the sphincter that refuses to relax. Is that the type of patient that we want to give fiber to? No. So pre-op, they're going to be low fiber, but look, high calorie, high protein. Why? Calorie gives you energy. This patient needs energy for wound healing, right? And remember, with the patient with her strength disease, they don't want to eat anyway. So when it comes to physiological integrity, what keeps our patient alive the longest, what can kill them the fastest, is it nutrition part of physiological integrity? Absolutely. So we have to make sure they have a high calorie, high protein. Professor D, why protein? What else is good for wound healing? Protein. As students, I think you forget. I think you, when you think of healing, you only think of vitamin C, but uh, protein is good for healing as well. It's necessary for healing. So pre-op patients are going to have enemas, low fiber, high calorie, high protein diet. In older children, preparation for the pull-through procedure, that's how um, they do this, uh, the procedure. It involves emptying the bowels with saline enemas and decreasing bacterial flora with, um, with I can't speak, with oral or systemic antibiotics. Because remember, guys, um, you have, just like you have normal flora of your oral mucous membranes, you have a normal flora of the vagina. You have normal flora within your GI tract, guys. Where was I? With saline enemas, decreasing bacterial flora with systemic antibiotics and colonic irrigations using antibiotic solution. Remember, this is a surgery and we don't care what type of surgery a patient has. Whenever a patient has surgery, we're always going to be concerned about them bleeding out. We're always going to be concerned about DVT pulmonary embolism and we're always going to be concerned about what? Infection. Okay. So pre-op, we're going to make sure that that patient gets antibiotics. We're going to do and especially, look what kind of surgery this patient is going to be having. It has to do with um, the GI tract that has fecal matter. We need to make sure that this patient does not get a systemic infection, that it doesn't turn septic. We're going to do frequent monitoring of vital signs and blood pressure for signs of shock. DVT, pulmonary embolism infection, and what? Bleeding, hemorrhage, bleeding to the point that their organs can start to shut down and they go in shock. So yes, we're going to be watching out for signs and symptoms of shock. We're going to be looking at um, the urine output start to go down. We're going to be looking at the blood pressure start to go down. We're going to be looking at the heart rate start to go up. All of those signs and symptoms of shock, we're going to be monitoring. We're going to be monitoring fluid and electrolyte replacement and plasma or other blood derivatives, observing for symptoms of bowel perforation. This is a medical emergency, guys. So I guess we're talking about post-op now because we're talking about bowel perforation. Think about it, bowel perforation. If their bowel were to perforate, that means we would have fecal matter in what's supposed to be a sterile environment. That is a medical emergency. So you need to watch out for those signs and symptoms of bowel perforation. What are those? Fever, increasing abdominal distension. And let me take that further. Where they say increasing abdominal distension, this patient will all of a sudden have an abdomen of... Um, a washboard, it'd be very, very, very hard and firm, okay? Vomiting, increased tenderness, irritability, dyspnea, cyanosis. Make sure you know those signs and symptoms of perforation. You're going to measure that patient's abdominal circumference with a paper tape measure. This is your key at the level of the umbilicus. At the level of the umbilicus or the widest part of the abdomen, for testing purposes, that's usually what they give you, the level of the umbilicus, that's going to be your answer. The point of measurement is marked with a pen to ensure reliability of subsequent measurements. So that way, every time we measure afterwards, we can see, okay, is this distension getting worse or better?
uh, use the tape measure can be left in place beneath the child rather than removed each time. And you're definitely not going to leave the patient's room and use that same tape on another patient. That is your patient's tape, okay? Infection control. When the colostomy is performed, the child who is of preschool age, I put a star next to this, make sure you know it. The child who is of preschool age is told about the procedure in concrete terms with the use of visual aids. Because remember, um, at the preschool age, that is their level of understanding. So you're going to give it to in very simple and concrete terms and usual use a visual aid. And a great visual aid that you can use with a child as a preschool age is what? A doll, something that they can hold or play with. Post-op. Okay, now we're at post-op. Some children will, will require daily anal and dilations of the post-operative period to avoid autonomic strictures. Parents are often taught to perform the procedure in the home and they'll be taught before discharge. Guys, that's it. That's your Hirschsprung disease in a nutshell. That is the most important thing that you need to know about her sprint. So guys, let me know what you thought about this video. Let me know if there's anything else in peds you would like to see covered. Don't forget, I cover questions, <coughs> excuse me, almost daily on my other social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. Please, if you can, support my channel by sharing my content on your social media platform. Share it with a friend, a colleague, a coworker, a classmate, even your nursing instructor. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video and you guys catch me on the next video.